Okay, welcome into another edition of the Penn State Blitz. Uh, Bob Flounders here, uh, remote edition again. Greg Pickles joining me as well. Always great to hear from Greg. We're now in early May, so who hopefully uh, some good things are around the corner. Uh, this edition of the Penn State Blitz, uh, Greg and I had a chance to talk to Penn State coach James Franklin uh, on Wednesday. He talked about uh, some of the things that go into a, fe- a, a football restart, not only for Penn State, but nationally. Um, he also talked about recruiting, talked about the relationship with uh, new offensive coordinator <clears throat> Kirk Soraka and uh, quarterback Sean Clifford. Penn State has yet some more recruiting news. They got another four-star, a defensive end. We're going to get to that. And then Greg and I are going to close with the Penn State mailbag. So, Greg Pickle, I hope you're doing well. Uh, the sun is out. It's May. Uh, we talked to James Franklin, but are you doing everything good with you in the Middletown area? Yes. Hello, Bob. Of course, we're a day late on the Penn State Blitz this week because of uh, Coach Franklin's news conference. But I think it's worthwhile that we waited a day to get this info in because I think it's a lot of he answered. You know, when he talked for about an hour, he answered a lot of the questions many Penn State folks had. So I thought that was good. And uh, all's well here, Bob. I hope the same for you and all the listeners as uh, the weather starts to maybe get nice a little bit. Yeah. What what stood out to you most? Uh, he was asked a, a couple different ways about uh, a football restart. What jumped out to you the most, Greg, about his comments concerning? Obviously, there's nothing really known yet. I think a lot of people are in kind of still in wait and see, mo- see wait and see mode here in in May. But you know, we're not in March. We're not in April anymore. We're getting closer to the start of summer. It'll be June before you know it. I think I think there's a good chance in June we might be we might hear from the Big Ten and what they want to do as far as a conference. We haven't heard from the NCAA. But James definitely had some uh, some thoughts on maybe what we might potentially see uh, regarding a football restart with Penn State. Yeah, so it's actually I actually kind of chuckled, Bob. You know, there were a lot of people that reacted pretty negatively to Sandy Barber, Penn State's athletic director, saying probably a month ago now that uh, six months or six weeks rather, I'm sorry, is probably what how, the amount of time that would be needed. But uh, James Franklin kind of struck a similar tone. He said, you know, if we had to do it in a month, we could. Maybe two months would be best. So it seems like Sandy and the the sports science folks at Penn State and James are all on the same page that. Um, look, they'll, they'll get guys ready as fast and as quickly and as healthy as they can, but this is not going to be an overnight process. You know, you mentioned the NCAA. They are going to meet. The, the date to watch now to me is May 13. So they meet May 13, and they will decide then whether or not to extend the recruiting dead period through the end of June. Currently, that's set to expire June 1. And if it does extend, Bob, that means Penn State's going to basically have no time to host anyone on campus, uh, at least until July, and they'd have to rework the calendar to add some days at that point in time. So as you said, there's a lot of things we don't know. Um, And the key is flexibility. You know, everyone has to be ready to play by whatever rules um, are given by conferences, by schools, by states, by the NCAA, whatever. I guess one thing, Bob, the big takeaway for me was uh, he is very much on board, as I think all of us are, with having a football season if it's safe and healthy to do so whenever and wherever it can be played. So, you know, I think – we don't know a lot of the answers that we need at this point. And he even brought up the point of, you know, when we do get back together, do you have all your quarterbacks meet together? And that's one of the many logistical hurdles they're going to have to deal with. He was asked by ESPN, have you come up with a plan yet uh, in case you got, uh, you know, COVID-19 and had to be quarantined for 14 days or whatever? And he said, no, not really. But we have started talking about what meetings will look like in a world where if you know you're around a person that gets sick you're going to have to quarantine so there's a lot of things to figure out here i think the key is going to be flexibility bob i also think that james is really uh, among the leaders of college football and college athletics it's going to push for allowing those who can to do even if it means not an entire conference or not every conference is doing things all at the same time yeah, and I also think, uh, you know, I think I, not just James, I think football coaches in general, Greg, are starting to kind of at least prepare for a scenario where, you know, if football does return, whether it's in a, a later start, um, they're supposed to open in early September, whether it's a smaller season or whether it's even pushed back 
and it runs into 2021, um, you know, the possibility that there might not be fans. And James was talking about that. And he said, you know, um, I think a lot of people, even if they had to watch from a distance rather than be at Beaver Stadium, would take that over no football at all. He wants the football season, I think, at some point this season to resume sooner rather than later. And I think he's prepared, much like other programs, are prepared to make a lot of concessions to get some football on, you know, on the field sooner rather than later. Yeah, there's no question. I mean, I think ultimately what it comes down to when you listen to some of these experts and, and so, you know, James Franklin's very clear that he wants us to be something that's decided by health experts and scientists and so on and so forth. But um, from the athletic expert side of things, it's pretty clear that college football won't happen if students aren't back on campus. They're not going to bring student athletes back simply for sports and have every other student at the, at the university learning from home. So that's obviously going to be a big key to all of this. And I guess the big, uh, you know, thing is will Penn State be willing to have a season without fans sounds like to me that they will of course that's one thing to say it now and one thing to actually follow through on it when uh when it's that time but you know ultimately I think um you know what James Franklin Sandy Barber Penn State fans you and I everybody else wants is some kind of a season whether it's in September October next March whatever uh, as soon as it's healthy and safe to do so and I think that everyone will work towards that goal all right, Greg, let's move it along. Uh, James has asked about Kirk Shiraka and the relationship between him and Sean Clifford. And uh, he thinks that even though they, they've been, you know, dealing with each other on a remote basis and they're trying to install a new offense, the fact that Sean's a veteran and Kirk is so highly regarded as an offensive coordinator who's been coaching for 30 years, he thinks it's going to be, uh, I think, fairly seamless giving the obstacles they have to overcome. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously we've heard Kirk talk about the fact that he has not been able to um, to see those guys throw in person. That obviously is a bit of a problem. But when it's all said and done, um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that Kirk Shiraka is uh, able to communicate with these guys every day any way that he wants to. And that's obviously something that's uh, that's been able to, that's allowed them to be able to move things forward and get to know the playbook, get to know each other, so on and so forth. And I thought James Franklin made a good point, which was that when, uh, you know, Kirk Scirocco was hired, all these guys have connections throughout college football because of the recruiting process and technology and all that. And so they were able to get the scoop kind of on Kirk from uh, Minnesota folks and things like that, people that they knew from the Elite 11 and camps and all that. So when you put it all together, I don't think Penn State's offensive production is going to be that far behind um, where it should have been uh, going into spring practice by the time they do get back on campus for drills. Clearly, um, they have a good plan in place, and they've continued to evolve that plan pretty much each and every day. All right, Greg, uh, before we talk about Penn State recruiting, I know you had a busy Sunday. I don't know if you were ready for it. Um, why don't you tell these kind uh, listeners and viewers uh, what they can do to rate uh, our, our, Penn, our Penn State Blitz podcast and to uh, go to the YouTube channel, all that good stuff. Yeah, so you're listening to the Penn Live Penn State Blitz podcast. Obviously, usually it comes out Thursday morning, but we're recording Thursday morning because of James Franklin's Wednesday news conference. So like, rate, subscribe on Apple, on Spotify, on Stitcher, wherever you get your audio. And of course, we have the video version available too, youtube.com slash all Penn State. You know, Greg, let's talk a little bit about this four-star recruit from the great state of Indiana. I believe Penn State actually flipped him from the Hoosiers program did it surprise you they were able to get this kid? And what do you know about him? Yeah, you know, Bob Rodney McGraw's a uh, six foot, uh, six foot five, two thirty, I believe is what he is. So the interesting thing to me about that was uh, John Scott Jr. We didn't really know what kind of prospect he'd be looking for, what kind of prospect he liked. Um, it seems that he likes the same thing that Sean Spencer did, which is a longer uh, maybe a little bit lankier defensive end that can maybe grow up at one point. I don't think McGraw's in this category, but it seems like they'll still look for ends that could maybe be tackles one day. And they're okay with guys being a little bit thinner than maybe you would prefer or, or, or uh, you know, expect coming on to campus because they like this plan that they've developed of bringing guys in, 
having Dwight Galt and his staff really work them up for a year, maybe a year or two, and then have them ready to go come their redshirt freshman or redshirt sophomore season. So with McGraw, I think he fits that mold absolutely perfectly. He's a guy that, um, again, it's going to take some work and development time. But I think that, you know, we see with John Scott Jr. that, you know, Brent Pry has a plan in mind when it comes to who they're going to recruit at defensive end in every position, of course. And Rodney McGraw, Rodney McGraw fits that, that mold. And the other thing, too, that was interesting, I got to talk to him on Wednesday day of this week and you know he was not impacted by um, the coaching changes at Penn State but he was impacted by the coaching changes with the Hoosiers so Tom Allen's Indiana team lost a defensive line coach lost a strength and conditioning coach and I think McGraw kind of looked at it and said hold on a second the two guys I would spend the most time with on a college campus they no longer are going to be here I have a good relationship with coach Pry, with coach Franklin with coach Galt I just got to get to know John Scott Jr. the new defensive line coach he was able to do that and when all said and done, Bob, Penn State gets its guy. They're now up to 11 commits in this class of 2020. And, you know, they have some work to do still. There's no question about that. But, you know, if you go back and listen to the Blitz episodes uh, on YouTube slash all Penn State and uh, to places you get your audio, um, you would have heard mailbag segments where we were talking about a lot of the concern and hand wringing going on related to, um, you know, related to a lack of commitments. And that is now completely by the wayside as Penn State works its way into the top 15 of the recruiting rankings in the country. All right, let's move on to the final segment, the Penn State mailbag. Greg, it's always my favorite. I know it's yours as well. Just a, a little uh, little cleanup duty. Somebody somebody tried to say last week, I know it's not Penn State related, Greg, but somebody tried to say that the Kentucky Derby was going to run last Saturday at Oakland. I think you scoffed at it, but I think after you saw the race, it's going to be one of two horses. You know who I like, but you also had some disparaging things to say about the late pick four and its price. You were wrong on both counts. What have you learned uh, about Charlatan and Nadal as we get ready for a September Kentucky Derby? Two good horses. I'll be backing Charlatan, and I will not be making any more predictions about the price that pick fours will play uh, pay at Arkansas tracks in the future. So, um, yeah, I guess we're getting back to, again, not necessarily the topic of the mailbag, but I guess we're getting back or closer to some more live sports here besides horse racing. We'll have UFC this weekend. I believe golf and NASCAR return next weekend. So, um, you know, it's it's while everything is not opening up here in PA and, of course, not across the country, uh, it is encouraging that some of these leagues are moving closer to in-person competition without fans, of course. But college football i think is going to follow the model that these other leagues do at least to some extent now again the biggest difference in james franklin talked about it yesterday uh, and we'll get to the mailbag questions in a second but james franklin talked about yesterday um basically this idea that the nfl is a little bit different than college of course and so are all the pro sports because they have bargaining power and the players and the league can work together to hash out any issues related to testing or quarantine or this that or the other thing and everything uh you know everyone can come to an agreement and move on it's not really the case with the colleges so they'll have to modify these plans some but there's no doubt that college football was never going to be the first uh sports league to reopen in this country uh, or anywhere for that matter so to get to that point some of these other places had to give it a shot give it a try and now we're at a point where that's happening so like you said earlier bob i think we'll learn a lot over the next month over the next month and a half and uh Let's get into the mailbag. So, like, you know, as we've mentioned numerous times now, James Franklin talked for about an hour. One of the things he had touched on was, I believe it was the last question he was asked, which basically uh, sort of was on the topic of getting guys to where they want them weight wise and things like that. And he basically said, well, we just got to deal with it. But in your mind. In 2020, with the technology that's out there, with um, the increase in body weight workouts, and I think he said one kid was mom must be a cook or something. She was curling, uh, you know, grease buckets is what he said. Um, or do you think it's going? How far behind do you think these kids are going to be when it comes to strength and conditioning? And do you agree with this idea from a lot of folks? And I think James has put it out there as well that um, that you know. It, the guys used to show up. They didn't have summer programs before. Guys used to show up on campus in August for camp, and they've had a cu couple days of conditioning, but they had to do it mostly on their own. Do you think this day and age kids can still do that and be just fine to play at a high level? Well, one thing that's going to, I think, uh, be in the favor of most teams is that it's going to be an even playing field. Everyone's been working with body weights, and no one really, I think, has a, a huge advantage when it comes to conditioning. I don't know that he – I think I, – I think 
you know, I think it would be more than two weeks of physical conditioning before practice starts to get these guys ready. I do think that maybe some of those early games are going to be a little bit dicey uh, in terms of, you know, conditioning and endurance and stamina, just because um, the fact that they didn't have spring, I think, uh, and I think the nutrition is going to be extended. Uh, the fact that they've been, you know, really without any kind of significant meal plan since, you know, late February, early March, it's, it's a long time to go to get up to, uh, to get up to speed. It's a lot that's going to have to come together in six to eight weeks when football does restart. I, I would expect both a lot of teams won't really hit the ground running for a couple of weeks and they're going to have to be careful with how they manage their rosters early in the season. Cause I don't see it being a normal year. And, you know, the fact that they did it in the mid nineties when James is the quarterback at East Stroudsburg, um, that's a long time ago. And these are bigger bodies now. And I think the bigger you are, I think the more you really need to maintain your conditioning, because if you're 330 pounds in, you know, 2020 and you go without significant weight training and you're not eating the right food, I think, I think you could probably go up to 350 in a hurry. I think it's a little bit of a concern, but knowing James Franklin and Dwight Galt and that, that staff, they're going to have a plan for everything. I just think it might take a little bit longer, you know, than four or five weeks to get a team ready uh, to play when football restarts. You mentioned roster size, and one of the things James Franklin was asked is whether or not he's concerned with Penn State being able to get under the NCAA mandated 85-man scholarship limit. Right now, our count has him at 87. Bob, do you think it'd be fair to waive that cap for one season and and realize the situation? And now look, some teams are going to be at 82, 83, and they're going to cry foul and say it's not fair. And uh, you know, so maybe it's not a good idea based on the whole idea of an even playing field. But let's be honest, so much about this is going to be uneven what's one more thing do you think it'd be fair to expand the roster sizes a little bit to allow for some more bodies i think especially for practice and scout team stuff too um where you don't want your best players necessarily out there getting beat up day in and day out but maybe you just don't have enough guys to do it and did you uh, so i believe that's the first part of the question the second part of the question was were you surprised when he said he thinks 10 percent of the roster might be a little bit leery about coming back to campus (laughs) whenever it's okay to do so uh, a little surprised. I don't, a 10% might be a little bit high, but I think there might be some players that are a little nervous, and that's understandable. Um, uh, and as far as the roster size itself, you know, if they wanted, if the NCAA and, and, and the conferences wanted a couple, a few more players, I think in light of what we're going through, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that there would be a big, uh, a, 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 I don't, I can't imagine there would be a lot of uh, programs that would be upset. 85 they were even even in a perfect world greg if if they had had a spring and there was no coronavirus they wouldn't probably have a tough time getting down to 85 anyway so um yeah the fact that a lot without without a spring i think a couple kids that maybe would have maybe thought about transferring or 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 lining up some other uh programs i I think that got delayed so i i do think that um the possibility of a slightly expanded scholarship limit for 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 the short term might make a little sense because teams are going to be scrambling when this thing does come together. And it's, it's certainly an extraordinary year. So it calls for maybe some extraordinary measures. Last question for you, Bob, what, uh, you know, there's a chance, I think, that at some point in the near future, we could hear from some Penn State players, some of those student athletes who are finishing up spring and everything else. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. I don't know. Penn State's been very good about letting some people within the program talk. Perhaps student athletes will be next. If that is true, who's maybe the one or two guys you think would be most interesting to hear from and why? Oh, it's always Micah Parsons. He's by far uh, my favorite interview. You never know what he's going to say. He generally likes interacting uh, with the press. I remember in the fall, he had a puppy named Simba that he was really worried about. I'm curious how that training's going and also how Mike is kind of just dealing with uh, the downtime. Yes, he's a Harrisburg high guy, but he's also the best player on the team. Sean Clifford's another guy that I think is very engaging, very interesting. Um, Those two come to mind. Um, You know, there's going to be some other guys, I think, as as we get to know this new team, uh, as they get a little bit more access, we get a little bit more access to them. Uh, they're going to be interesting to talk to. PJ Mustafer is another guy that's always got some interesting things to say. But Mike is at the top of my list. What about you? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I'll go a slightly different direction. I would love to hear from a couple of the younger guys on the team. I think the veterans um, probably are a little bit more experienced with uh, dealing with changes. Obviously, they've had position coach changes. They've had all kinds of things going on. So I think that maybe they were probably, some of them anyway, were probably quicker to adjust. But I'd be curious how some of the younger guys on this roster, like a Daniel George or a CJ Thorpe, who's not really young anymore, but hasn't played as much, you know, he's a good personality. And I just be curious to hear how these guys are doing stuff at home you know it's great to throw around terms like body weight and things like that but does it really work and can they tell it's working you know they don't have the strength and conditioning staff to give them metrics about what's working and what's not you know so they don't i don't know if there's a way to reinforce some of the things they are doing and so i think that you know thorpe's obviously a, a personality that people love to hear from journey brown's a good quote i'd be curious to hear what he's doing out in the meadville area assuming that's where he is so you know yeah, anyone at this point would really be a good, uh, you know, window into what these guys are going through, how they finish the spring semester and what comes next. So, Bob, before we close it out, you got anything else for me? Nothing else. I'm just going to say stay safe. Make sure Lola is well fed. Lots of peanut butter for her. And uh, ho- hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we're going to get a little bit clarity, a little bit of clarity as to what the season's going to look like. I mean, I don't know that it's December, September 5th. Uh, is really realistic, but we'll find out. Um, but I think I think James Franklin's right. He feels good. There's going to be some kind of a season. I agree with him. I'm just curious when they're actually going to start and when they're actually going to let players back on campus. It could be a little while yet. 